Okay. I just see, seen your message, Sharon, no problem. If you can have video on, great. And if not, I understand. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Welcome to this evening. Thanks for joining us. So my name is Callie, and I am in uh, Weaverville, North Carolina, which is just a little bit outside of Asheville. And just to acknowledge the land that I'm nearby, I'm close to the Ivy River, is the nearest body of water in the Appalachian Mountains. And that's my home. So grateful to be here. And Leanne is here with me this evening. We're going to be doing something together tonight. <laughs> yes, I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. And the nearest body of water is probably two hours away. Lake <laughs> Jin, Alaska. Yeah. Well, we like to start these evenings with a little bit of slowing down and getting connected to what is larger than us and however we define that spirit, God, higher power. Uh, and so we just do a, do a moment of invocation and Leanne's going to lead us in that. Everybody go ahead and just get comfortable in your chairs and just take a deep breath. Yeah, it looks like the chance for rain will certainly be coming back, but it's still a few days. <laughs> We're going to mute you all. If you are not muted, go ahead and mute yourself. There's been a lot of rain in the forecast. Yes, there has been. So let's just go ahead and take a deep breath in and through your nose and out through your mouth and just settle into your chair as I do this invocation. Guardians of the East, I call upon you and I ask for your wisdom to come in. I ask that the mental body be in a place of neutrality, that wisdom flow through our minds like the air and clarity come in as we do this beautiful talk about recovery. And guardians of the South, I call upon you and ask for your wisdom that the emotional body, that passion and love and childlike innocence come in, the place where summer resides and the place where joy lives. And guardians of the West, I call upon you and I ask for your wisdom. I ask that you come in where transformation takes place and transmutation is alive and manifestation is present. And the place where slumber comes in. And guardians of the North, the place of belonging, I call upon you and I ask for your wisdom to come in. The place of the ancestors and the place of the elders to come in and to hold the space for us in a good way. And I call upon the up above to the cosmos, the Milky Way, Mother Moon and Father Sun to come in and to help anchor us upon this earth's plane, but also into the great mystery. And I call upon Mama Pacha, Mother Earth, to come in, to anchor us into her crystalline core, to help us to feel connected and grounded in a space where our feet are grounded like the trees, rooted and anchored into this earth's plane. And I call upon the spirit within great spirit, the God that is within, to come in to help us to feel a sense of belonging, connection, and love, to help us to feel this. And I ask that the hollow bone be present, that we, Callie and I, be the hollow bone that you wish for us to be, to be of service to these beautiful humans that are in front of us today. And I call upon our well-seated ancestors, the ones who lived well and died well, the ones that came before us, these bright and shiny ones. And I call upon our wealth, our spirit guides for our highest good to come in and to bear witness to this session, but also to hold the space for us in a way that we feel protected and safe. And with great honor and humility, 
I open the circle. I'll share. Ashe, blessed be. Thank you, Leanne. Hmm. And so that invocation speaks to the four cardinal directions and the great above and the great below and the medicine wheel, which is a tool that we often use in our work with Rites of Passage Council. So just to speak a little bit to who Leanne and I are, we'll just share a brief brief bit. So yeah, my name is Callie and I've been working with ROPC Rites of Passage Council for about eight years now. And we'll get into a bit more of our personal stories later and how we arrived to this moment with you good people. Uh, but, you know, in short, my work has continually evolved into more and more of earth-based practices. I started my journey in wilderness therapy, working with adolescents, and then found my way into graduate work and counseling work and have a private practice as a therapist and continually weave this thread of uh, how to bring more earth-based healing into my work with people who are recovering from addictions and trauma and uh, find that it's it's one of the, the most effective tools that I've found for myself. And so um, my hope is that we can impart some of that uh, inspiration onto each of you tonight. Leanne, do you want to share anything about yourself? Yeah. So I'm Leanne. I um, am a holistic practitioner uh, specializing in medicine, shamanic work, and um, hypnosis and recovery coaching. And so I've, I've been with ROPC for about two and a half years because I felt a calling. And so I'll get into that later, but um, kind of similar to what uh, Callie said, there's a very big need, especially in the recovery field and recovery to be connected to nature and how important it is in recovery, but also in life in general for everyone actually so my passion actually started mm, about i've been doing this work for about 10 years now and uh, have found it very beneficial not only in the recovery field but as as a, you know with many of my other clients emerging um shamanic practices and hypnosis and how it it certainly uh plays a big role in not only changing the mind, but also shifting um, the spirit as well. And so it is a, it is a great um, honor to be able to be able to help people in that, in, in that way. And I have found it very useful in my own journey, not only in recovery, but as a human, with uh, holistic work and uh, nature around us. And so that is why I'm in, be in front of you all. So thank you. Thank you, Leanne. All right. Well, I think first we just wanna talk a little bit about rites of passage, right? What is, what is rites of passage? Maybe some of you are familiar with rites of passage in your own lives and maybe you've even done some of this work before but just to offer a little bit of framework for what we're speaking to and so rites of passage and rites of passage initiatory uh, ceremony is something that is historical over you know thousands of years that it's pan-cultural and so if you look across the world you'll find in in every region of the world a different name for a rite of passage ceremony and it may be uh, you know so the the indigenous peoples particularly to this region uh, the cherokee peoples and the lakota peoples they would uh, call the vision quest which is actually a european word given to the ceremony humblecha humblecha which means to cry for a vision 
And so that was the, the word that they had. And then vision quest was actually the, the language that Europeans gave to mm -hmm. the ceremony when they came to this land and colonized it because they had their reference for what was happening and a ceremony that was happening was uh, the King Arthur, <laughs> the, the King Arthur expeditions. And so they thought of quest, like to go out on a quest. And so this word vision quest came to be. And so there's been some evolution of vision quest or vision fasting, but that's typically the wording that you'll hear used for a rite of passage ceremony. So just to give some history there. And then in other places, um, like the, the aboriginals in Australia, they call it a walkabout. And so there's this way that, um, or in Scotland and Ireland, they call it mountain walking. And so in every region of the world, you'll find that there's a term to describe this, this ceremony where you go out into nature uh, in solitude and typically fast for a number of days, usually three or four days. And the intention of these ceremonies then, uh, back then, were really a, a way to mark a transition from one phase of life to the next. And oftentimes, you know, we think of transitioning from adolescence to adulthood or childhood into more responsibility as an adolescent person. Uh, and those were usually when these rites of passage ceremonies were offered. And there are many other times in our lives where rite of passage ceremonies are uh, helpful and you know, I, there are, just coming to the top of my head, there are these moments where, you know, we get married, we get divorced, we become a mother, a father, uh, we start a business, we grieve the death or the loss of someone that we love. These are all rites of passages in our lives. And the first one, kind of that initial one, moving from adolescence into adulthood, you will find that our modern day society, our modern day culture has really lost the art of rite of passage and initiatory ceremony for our youth and for our young people. And so we have a lot of, um, a lot of individuals who are walking around uninitiated and there's this hunger. I, I think of it as a hunger and I certainly felt it as a hunger when I was when I was in that place, that there's this hunger to initiate, to self-initiate, to move forward through that threshold into this next stage of life. And without the guidance of other initiated elders, we find ourselves attempting to do that on our own. It's in our bones, it's in our DNA for thousands of, you know, for thousands of years, our ancestors have done this. And so, we seek that out, usually unconsciously. And that looks like often a pseudo initiation. And so those take the form of joining fraternities and sororities and reckless drinking and driving and using drugs and trying to find a way to move yourself from the place that you're at into the place that you're going. And if we and, and when we do that without the guidance of elders, it, it often results in, in death or addiction or troubled lives in between places. And, you know, sometimes we, we get through those, those pseudo initiations and, and, you know, we make it through and we carry on with our lives. And, uh, and yet what I find is that people who come to our, to our programs and are in a place where they're longing for that rite of passage in their lives, that there's something that has been missed. There's this, there's this feeling that people describe to me that I know in myself that I've experienced of, uh, there's something that I'm missing here. There's something that wasn't completed. There's something that I'm longing for and I don't quite know how to describe it. I just know that uh, when I think of being in, in nature, and connecting with the natural world and having an opportunity to really be with this unfinished place, that feels right. 
And so uh, that's, you know, sometimes all the information we have. And what Leanne and I want to offer is just a bit more, uh, I guess, personal experience to share with, with each of you and also uh, more description of what a rite of passage looks like. There's four distinct phases that Leanne's going to talk about in a, in a couple minutes um, that you can really start to tune into your own lives and maybe where your own uh, thresholds are or your own in-between places moving from one place to another in your life and get curious about where you're at, what stage of this rite of passage uh, are you at, what stage of initiation are you at in your life. And yeah, I'll pause there for a minute. Leanne, do you want to add anything to that? I think you said that beautifully, by the way. Yeah, I think that that pseudo, you, you made a, a, a huge point on that hunger for initiation and so it, it, it goes along with the topic that we are speaking about as far as recovery and how the initiatory um the phases and in the initiatory coincide with recovery because of the fact that you know oftentimes people will go to alcohol drugs sex whatever kind of addiction it is and that's part of the calling that that there's four phases and we've got four phases which are the calling the severance phase the um threshold phase and the reincorporation phase and and the calling phase is essentially is who am i who 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 am i i hear something happening something is happening life is not working out the way that um i want it to or something is stirring inside of me i hear something i'm not quite sure what it is i feel kind of often people will say i feel stuck you know and i know that in in my own personal recovery that was that was one of my my um calling moments and um this and, and sometimes and, and you will hear it in um if those of you who have not been in recovery that they, they speak of it as the gift of desperation there is a a desperation that happens in that moment a longing you can feel it in your emotions you can feel it in your physical body whether you have experience with addiction or not that is the calling and um, the phase, the the as uh, severance severance phase is more of like I see the signs everywhere. All the signs are pointing to change. My spirit is raw, rawing inside. It's 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 rumbling. It it needs something. There's an action that needs to take place. And oftentimes, when it's those who are in active addiction, it would be something to the effect of something outside of them says, "Hey, you need to go to recovery." Or I might say, "Hey, I need to do." Um, I need to stay in um, a 28 day program or I need to um, do something, ask for help. That is the severance phase. That is often the place as well as of the non-human and human form. So the signs are the non-human. And so um the other part is something that we call it the mythological death, but it's also the understanding, the recognition that something inside of me must die so that something new can become, it invoke in me so that I can move forward in a way that I have a visual of life being different. Um, and then you have the threshold. The threshold is the, what we call the non-ordinary world, the, where spirit takes a hold of us and says, and, and, and creates, we've taken this action. We've got, we've gotten to the calling. We've taken this action and we're into that place of severance, um, the threshold. It's the in-between place and where spirit takes us and takes a hold of us 
and uh, shows us a different way. And at, at some point, you don't realize it until you get to the other side that spirit has taken a hold of you and something completely emerges within you. That is the threshold, the the uh, some in recovery there we we talk about the spiritual awakening occurs or an awakening happens and things are different and then you have the incorporation phase and that's the giveaway and the giveaway is also about um being of service and that's what we're doing right now is giving it away um and that's how um I continue to get to show up for my life is all the things that the calling, the severance phase, the, all the pain that I went through, all of the, the, the knowing the action and, and that spiritual awakening occurs. And I get to give it away that it, it's, we call it uh, in the rites of passage, the giveaway is how are you going to show up in your world now that you've been given a gift? And so, um, and it's also about, you know, uh, treating yourself with integrity and, um, and uh, also practicing life in the place of being alive, in the place of being alive, if that makes sense. Um, and connecting to spirit. Did I miss anything, um, Callie? No, I think that was beautiful, Leanne. I, I mean, there's so much that we could there's say about so, those four yeah, like, phases, right? I mean, Leanne just... and I, yes, Leanne and I were in a, you know, part of our work in Rites of Passage Council is going through a year and a half long training, and there's a whole week that's dedicated to just these four phases. And so just to, you know, just, and that feels like it's kind of like just touching yeah. on it even. So beautiful beautiful you know in the few minutes and yeah. i think just us sharing a bit more about our stories which we're going to do here in a moment um, just to offer some ways that you can start to work with your your personal story and if you're in recovery um, you know your recovery story can become a personal mythology and we'll talk a little bit more about how that um, what we mean by that and and if you're not in recovery and you're just curious about this work that even you know your story as an individual can be a guiding post a guidepost for you uh, in the way that your life is unfolding because mythology and myth and story they're teaching tools right the, the story was a oral tradition passed down before things were written down as a way to offer teaching around many different topics and many different sects and chapters of life but uh, but the way that our own life can be a tool for reflection for teaching and you know those questions that um, if you're familiar with recovery language there's there's often these questions that are asked when somebody tells their their recovery story their story they they say you know what was it like what happened and what it's like now. And similarly, these four phases are a way to really understand what happened and what it's like now and where you came from. And that can be a window into where you might be going. And so even as an example, my first quest ceremony, what happened when I was out there in the wilderness and solitude in ceremony for the first time doing this work, the way that I made sense of it then is very different than the way that I'm making sense of it today and the meaning that I'm gleaning from it continues to change and evolve. And so my hope and my prayer is that that, that will continue to live alive, that'll be continue to be alive in me this story, this time out uh, on the mountain as a, as a guidepost for where I'm going, if that makes sense, you know, this way that um, I continue to understand it a little bit differently and it continues to surprise me um, what's in store there. 
So I'll stop talking. Leanne, do you want to uh, you want to share I your love story, that. and I then love I'll share a little bit more. I love you sharing that. That's that's brilliant because that's kind of where I feel. I feel that. Um, so I, I'm just going to share a little bit about my journey uh, as far as I'm going to do my best to correlate it with how the Brides of Passage became such a big and vital part of my reality as far as moving forward in my recovery as well. But so the calling for me, um, you know, my story, I was a uh, a cocaine addict and an alcoholic. And, uh, I also struggled with, um, with abuse and very surprised that I even I'm still alive. And, um, and that calling was, I knew that something had to change and without going too further, um, I had spent years with, um, you know, I'd started my recovery journey in, when I was 27, 25, and I got sober, like finally got sober at uh, 35. So I spent a big majority of my my adulthood um, battling addiction. And so that was my calling. And I, I you know, I had the gift of desperation and it was, um, it was brutal. And I don't want to go over my war story in a way. Um, meaning that I don't want to say, I want to share the gifts that were given to me as a result of recovery and getting sober. Um, I knew that I had to do everything different and I struggled with that for a very, very long time. And, you know, I'll give you a small, a short synopsis. I was homeless. I um, lived at the YWCA. I could, it was a daily thing. I had a really hard time with the fact that um, I couldn't try other substances so that I, um, and I had a hard time because alcohol and drugs were my best friend. And so there became a moment of clarity when I, uh, on my last day, and uh, I knew that I would become soul sick, that, uh, I would be a de dead woman walking, meaning that someone else, I witnessed someone else, um, I witnessed someone else who was absolutely dead inside. And it startled me in a way that it shaped, shaped, it shook me up. And I knew that I had spent so many times trying to commit suicide or trying to uh, use drugs and alcohol to, to numb the pain. And so my journey began and um, I used uh, everything from uh, holistic services. I took the action. I, I went to a 12 step program. I, um, I had mentors. I had people who really loved on me until I could love on myself because I didn't know how to love on myself. I didn't know what that meant. And I had to gain tools in order to do that. So that calling became my severance and I asked for help. And that was the hardest thing for me to do because as a result of that, asking for help was the hardest thing. But what I didn't realize is that it was going to be my life, a, a game changer. It was going to change my life in a way that I never thought possible. And what I mean by that is that woman that used, uh, you know, I lost my children. Um, I couldn't have healthy relationships. I didn't know how to have relationships. I had missed the rites of passage of learning how to be an adult. I missed the rites of passage of understanding what it meant to be a mother. I, I did not understand how to survive in a world that was so fast moving and I didn't have coping skills. And so, I ran with everything I had because I was desperate and willing to do everything I could. I'm going to get a little tearful <laughs> to, to change my life because I'd seen other people change and I wanted that so bad. And that moment where I, 
I had a Catholic God. So for me, it was like, I, I don't want anything to do with God or, or the name of God. And so like, for me, it was like, okay, I have to change everything. That means my perception of what my higher source or what source was looking like. And that's one of the things that I learned in uh, Rites of Passage as well as is that my God was bigger than every, it was everything and not just the man in the sky. And that was where my threshold came in. I began to have a relationship that was with something that I could not see, feel, or touch, but I knew, and I had the experience and the signs were pointing all to that higher source. And as a result of that, I did everything different and my life started shifting and I, it shifted in ways that I never had dreamt possible. You know, I stopped being homeless. I was able to work because I couldn't even work. I could, I didn't know how to work. Like I didn't know how to keep a job either. I didn't know how to be responsible. That's another rites of passage is being responsible and learning how to work. I didn't know how to do that. You know, I had to be taught all of that. And, um, and so you know, once I had this awakening in my life, you know, they tell you in recovery that it, you must give it away and in order to keep what you have. And so I began being of service in a way, and then it, it fueled my life up. It fueled me to the point where, oh my God, this is amazing. And I'm giving this away. And then, you know, as the years gone by, I'm 14 years sober. And where I couldn't even put together 30 days, I couldn't even put together six months. Matter of fact, the last time I went back out, I was a week away from being one year sober and I left a meeting to go get high. So that should tell you from where, what it was like and what it is like today. And, you know, as my journey has gone on, it has been, uh, spirit has called me to share recovery in a different way, in a more holistic way, because not everybody wants to go through the 12 steps. Not everybody's recovery story is the same and, and not one size fits all. And so I started diving into uh, being a recovery coach. I started diving into, and then I realized that I, I hit another plateau in my recovery and something wasn't working. And as a result of that, a spirit led me to the rites of passage. And that was the missing link for me as far as connecting, because I was feeling disconnected. I had gotten sober. I had gotten to that place of connection. I had gotten to that place of uh, clean for a while, but I knew that I needed something else. And I knew that my vision what I received in four days and four nights was going to help me to help others as well. And boy, was I right. It, 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 it brought me to you guys today, right here, right now. Um, I was inspired and um, nature has a beautiful way of telling us a story and connecting the dots to everything if we pay attention to it. And that's part of the gift is paying attention to everything and being willing to um, to be open-minded and to get grounded. And that's part of what the Rites of Passage has helped me to do is to not only continue to be grounded, but other ways of being allowing myself to be grounded to the elements, to the animals, to the trees and the plants, everything. And um, gosh, I can go on for hours about this, but um, that is a short synopsis of what my gift and the gift that I'm offering to the world is, is being able to give hope. You know, hope is alive. Um, I didn't believe that, that that was going to be my story, I thought I would die an alcoholic and a drug addict death. And I was willing to, to, to die that way. I was willing to, uh, I was okay with dying. And then I realized that life had a, another meaning for me and another way of, of showing me 
that um, I, I get to live a life I never thought I would. I get to travel the world. I get to have healthy relationships today. I get to be um, of service to people who were once like me. And um, and that's that that's enough for me. And um, I, I will I've always be grateful that I had that gift of desperation because once who I was before is not who I am today, but she does come up sometimes. So, and I, and I have ways of being able to do things differently. So thank you for letting me share. Thank you, Leanne. Thanks for your vulnerability and your willingness to just share all of that. So forward and open-hearted, thank you. I just wanna take a moment and maybe just pause in all of that before we move on. Maybe just in your own mind and body and heart, just taking in anything from Leanne's story or anything else that's been shared so far. That's, that's maybe sticking with, with you or even uh, seems to continue to circle back. Can't get your mind off of it. And just notice, notice what's alive in you. Just notice what's present in you. And before we roll into some more sharing, I also want to open it up for questions or reflections, and we'll have a little bit more time at the end also. But if there's anything that wants to be shared about your own experience with recovery or rite of passage specifically, um, or any, any other reflections really, it doesn't have to be specific to that. And if you want to share anything in the chat, you can do that as well if that feels more comfortable. I know sometimes these Zoom recordings can be, you know, we're all in this box of boxes and it <laughs> can be a bit uh, daunting sometimes to, to share or just not a little awkward. So if that feels more comfortable to share in the chat box, you can do that as well. Okay, well, I will go ahead and share a little bit about my journey and then we'll see where we're at. Uh, let's see, where do we start tonight? Um, taking a moment to get connected to what feels feels true and authentic tonight. So similar to what Leanne was sharing, I had a calling that lasted a few years. And, you know, I, I found my way to substances and alcohol and relationships um, at an age where I was really needing guidance that wasn't available to me. And at a time in my life where I felt lost, I felt uncertain, I felt unclear about who I was or what I even had to offer the world. And, you know, it's often that time in adolescence I 
I, I started at a fairly young age with substances and alcohol and and continued down that path searching for a solution, searching for a way out of my internal experience, searching for some sort of guidance to reveal an answer. And for a long time, I really believed that I might find it in drugs, I might find it in alcohol, I might find it especially in relationships that were toxic or dysfunctional that, you know, if it didn't, if they didn't have an answer that at least they afforded me relief from what I was experiencing internally. And that lasted about 10 years. And there were moments in those 10 years where I would have breakdowns and moments of crisis and I would think, you know, something's got to change here. But funnily enough, it was never the drugs and the alcohol and the relationships that needed to change, right? It was all these other pieces of my life that, okay, if I change this or if I change that or, and so, and so for a while, because, and I think you said this, Leanne, that the, the substances for me, you know, and, and the relationships and, and all of that, they became a, a, an ally that I didn't have elsewhere. They became a friend, you know, in a way. And uh, I believe that while they almost killed me, they also saved my life. And so there was this... Uh, this very fraught relationship <laughs> with this old, this old way of being, this old way of loving. We talk about sometimes this old way of loving ourselves and others. And um, for me, addiction was that. And so this, this inkling that I had of something's got to change would come and go and it would get bigger when there was crisis. And eventually, um, fortunately, there was a shift for me and it's not one that is easy to describe it's not as if i made a, a conscious decision one day to get up and do it differently i really experienced a way that uh, my ancestors my well and spirit ancestors were able to come in at a time of desperation when I was really ready to see them and to listen where I hadn't been before and to do something different. And for me, that looked like telling the truth. That looked like really naming the truth of what was going on and asking for help. And that was the severing for me because for me, you know, this way, this old way of being was do it all on my own, be hyper independent, somehow manage this insane way of living and change everything else but the addiction. But don't tell anybody about it because there's a lot of shame around that. And I'm going to fix it somehow and I'm going to control it and I'm going to manage it. And um, certainly wasn't ask somebody for help and say that I'm a mess and I, and I, and I need some support here. And it takes it, it, it takes whatever it takes for people to be in that place of deep surrender. And I again don't know if I would have gotten to that that surrender if it hadn't have been for spirit's intervention. And I had a series of events that happened that was a bit of a domino effect. I had a near death experience and then I had a an experience where <laughs> And it's funny to me now, but I, I got pulled over by a police officer and ran a stop sign and I was late to work. And that was just a mini reflection of the chaos of my life. Right. And and the police officer comes over and and I could see the stop sign in the rear view of my mirror. And, you know, he's writing me the ticket and I'm feeling anxious about getting to work. But all I could do was 
was keep looking up at my rear view mirror and see the stop sign behind me. And all I could think was this, this voice, and it didn't feel like mine coming in that said, just stop, just stop, just surrender. And, you know, it was a small moment. It wasn't some big burning bush moment, <laughs> right? But it was that. And that stayed with me. And by the end of that day, after a couple of other experiences that were, were trying and challenging, I had the breakdown, the breakthrough, the, all right, I'm going to tell my family what's really going on here. And not that they didn't have some idea what was going on, but, you know, the, the whole truth. And, uh, and that, was the, that was the severance for me. Just stop. I need to stop this old way of living and start to begin to unravel this these ways and you know my my the the part of me that is that addict part or that you know that wounded one um was trying to save my life and I have a lot of gratitude for her and uh, and so we just work together differently now we have a different agreement now about how we we interact with one another, this part of me. And, um, and then there was the threshold phase, right? There's that place of betwixt and between. We talk about the threshold. And the threshold in rites of passage and specific to vision quest or the that ceremony is that time in in solitude in wilderness fasting when you're connecting with the natural world with spirit god higher power however you describe that and so for me the first way that looked was um going to treatment and so i went to treatment and had some time there but then after treatment um you know it also looked like being in 12-step rooms and in a community that was healthy enough to hold me and support me because the community that I had had before certainly was not. And so there was some reorganizing of that. And then what it began to look like, that threshold time, because there's this period of time where you really don't know where the hell you're going. You just know you don't really want to go back to your old life. You kind of do. You kind of want to go back to it, but you don't really know what you're doing and you're kind of in this in-between place. And so it began to look like going out into nature for me and just sitting in nature and crying or screaming or being in silence or being not, you know, not sure what to do, but just going out there because that's what felt good. That's what felt right for me. And that was that threshold time. And then about a year, a little, a little over a year into recovery, I found my way to my first vision quest ceremony. And so I got to ritually enact what I had already been doing. And there were other people in my life who are familiar with this ceremony and could help guide me towards that. And really grateful that I had some mentors in my life to really help me get there. And uh, I fell in love with the ceremony. And it was the first time I did that ceremony that I thought, this is, um, there's something to this. This, this is connected to my work, what I'm supposed to be doing here. Um, and so I kept following that thread, just kept following that thread. And now it is my work. Now it is what I get to do. I get to go out into nature with people and support people and wherever they're at, recovery or not, um, and move through chapters in their life with support of earth, with air, with water, with fire, with community. And, you know, the recovery piece for Leanne and I is, is, um, is personal to us. And so we came together last year and we thought, let's start bridging these two because they definitely overlap. 
And so that's really the essence of why we're even sharing our stories tonight and, and why we're bringing in the rites of passage piece. Um, so I wanna pause there for a minute because I've talked plenty and see if there's any anything that anyone wants to share in that, any reflections or questions about some of the information we've given. Leanne, anything you want to add to any of it? I just want to read something. Um, this is actually written by your dad, uh, Kater, Kater Brown. You're born with a gift that only you carry. It is transmitted to you from the world of your ancestors. You're also given a proportionate amount of personal power necessary to deliver this gift. The majority of this power is used up in the dramas created to avoid the initiatory journey of descent necessary for remembering who you are and the medicine you carry. This disharmony and dis-ease that is so much a part of modernity is the pain and struggle of the gift itself not finding a way to be acknowledged and delivered. And that's essentially what we are sharing tonight is the gift and, and why it's important for everyone to share their own medicine and their own gift, because everybody has their own personal story to give and to help with. Thank you, Leanne. Yeah, I think I would just add to that that one of the tenets that we lean into is that each of us has personal medicine, personal gifts that are unique to us. And maybe many people might have a similar form, mm -hmm. right, or a similar gift, but the way that mm -hmm. you express it right is is very specific and unique to you and that it was really believed and i don't even know if we spoke to this piece but that part of stepping through these these thresholds and these initiatory descents is that you are going to remember something that you forgot that you had maybe at birth that you came into this world with, that is easy to forget and in the being humanness and remembering something that you forgot is really essential for the survival of the community. You don't just remember it for you, That's but right. you remember it so that you can bring it back to your people, whoever your people are, so that you stepping into your personal gifts and medicine can help your tribe, your community survive. And it was believed that if you didn't do that, the literal physical survival of the community would be lost. And I don't know that that's that far from the truth in the reality of the world that we live in today, that people are, you know, living their lives out of addictions and distractions and compulsions. And that if we're to maybe pause in that and have the support to remember what we need to remember, how different our, our lives might look and how different our culture might look. And so I just offer that as maybe some parting words and food for thought. Um, I'm just grateful to, to have the opportunity to share what's been shared with me and also just want to name that if if uh, any of this piqued your interest tonight and you're hungry for more, you're curious about more, Leanne and I are doing a five-day 
program in July that is going to be a deep dive into all of this. And uh, one of our brothers, Rio, is going to join us. And so the three of us are going to um, have this awesome time uh, near the Ivy River in the Appalachian Mountains, a five-day retreat where we're going to do a deep dive into the medicine wheel. There'll be a one-day fasting solo and um, we'll incorporate some other ritual and ceremony into that as well as along with some other teachings. And I'm gonna go so ahead and if put that, that piques your interest. Thank you. I was gonna say, will you put that in the chat? Yeah, I'm putting um, that for anyone who well. wants to explore more. Mm-hmm. Yes. I just want to see Sharon said, I totally agree with that. It is that important to remember our purpose for the survival. Yeah. Yeah. Survival of our culture as well as our individual life. Yeah. Thank you, Sharon, for sharing that. All right. All well, right. Any other words that want to be offered before we sign off for the evening? Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. River, I couldn't hear you, but I kind of lip read. It sounded like you said thank you. But thank you. Thank you both for your sharing. Mm. Thank you. Thanks for being here. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening, and maybe we'll see you around the fire sometime. Uh.